order business after rise up is to turn off your cell phones, please. The cell phones interfere with our sound system, and we're already having to deal with two poles that interfere with the sound system. So let's make it a little kinder and turn off our cell phones. Okay, let's all take a deep breath. And if it feels comfortable for you, close your eyes. And let's allow ourselves to be fully present in this place that has been dedicated for a very long time to opening hearts, awakening minds. It's been dedicated for a long, long time to take us into the core of our being where we know our magnificence, we know that we are the light of the world, where we can access our joy, our peace, our wisdom, our creativity, and our faith and our strength, and our commitment to keep growing, keep deepening, keep awakening. So we give thanks for this place, all those who came before us, those who had the vision to establish such a movement called Unity. So today, we once again open our hearts and minds to feel our unity, our oneness, with all of life, all of humankind, with the one presence known by many names. This service is turned over to spirit, and so it is, and so we let it be. Okay, here we are. We're now going to do together the Lord's Prayer, translated from the Aramaic language of Jesus. All together, please. Father and Mother, Earther and the breath of all, create the space inside of us and fill it with your presence. Let oneness now prevail. Your one desire then flows through ours as energy fills all forms. Give us this day our physical and spiritual nourishment, and untangle the knots of error that bind us as we release others. Do not let appearances make us forgetful of the source, but free us to act appropriately. From age to age, through you, flow the glorious harmonies of life. May these words be fertile statements through which our future grows. Amen, amen, and amen. Let's take a deep breath every Sunday when we gather together like this and we say these words. I hope you can feel the power, the incredible presence of spirit that happens within us and around us when we say this in a conscious way, not rote, <coughs> not like just hold on, but really connecting with the words. It's a powerful thing. Okay, for all of you who I don't know yet, and maybe you don't know me yet, my name is Margaret Miller. I'm privileged to serve as spiritual leader here at Unity. And I'd also like to introduce our morning team. It takes a village to have a church service. Our ushers this morning are Carol O'Guire and Terry Navaria. They're back there on the bench. And uh, our greeters and ushers on video this morning is Bunny Vaughn Healy. Sound is Melody. And our music team, Ryan on saxophone, he's back there in the chair. He's taking the rest after that solo. <laughs> <laughs> and our singers this morning are Marlene and Ann and Lori and Mary Lou, Paula, Patty, and Dave back there is on his flute and harmonica, Bill on the piano, Kevin on his guitar, Dan on drums, Tom on drums. Did I get everybody? <laughs> and then that doesn't speak to your board of directors, Charlene, staff, administrator, uh, all the people, the volunteers, many, many people that it takes to create this experience together as we call it. Georgetown, South Carolina. Y'all ever heard of Georgetown? And she's been doing that 
West Coast thing that a lot of people here did at one time or another. And she sounds like she's going to be making her way back home. So we're glad about that. And she sings, uh, she performs all over the place doing plays and special events. And you also are with the Agape International. I got the International Spiritual Center. I'm not in the choir, but I do sing there. You do sing there. And I speak there. And a lot of y'all know I got paid from Michael Beckwith's work and Ricky Byers' work, so welcome. Thank you. Okay, y'all. We are going to sing another song. When we do, we're going to pass the duo Kansas. This is not a regular offering. This is for your loose change, and it goes to help folks in our community who need a little extra support from time to time. And we are going to uh, stand when you're ready, and we're going to sing a song that we used to sing in the Pentecostal and charismatic church <coughs> and my other life. Okay. <laughs> peace like a river. One, two, three. I've got peace like a river. I have peace like a river. I have
What about being able to go to school? Because there's some kids in the world who can't go to school. Mm, <laughs> <laughs> You know what I give thanks for? I give thanks for my fig trees and the birds that come to my bird feeders, and I give thanks. For your mother. Say that again real loud. For your mother. <laughs> <laughs> for your life. And for your God. Oh, nice. So one of the things that we are here very, very grateful for is that you, you guys come here to remind us that we are the light of the world, to remind us that you have a lot to teach us and remind us of. We're really glad that you're here. That's one of the biggest things I'm grateful for today, that all of you are here. Because each one of us have a part in telling the wonderful story of our human family waking up and realizing that we really can be love and kindness in the world. We can make a world that works for everybody. That's what we learn about when we come here. And you're a part of that, all of you. So let's all stand. We're going to give thanks for you by doing our blessing. And it is going to be up on the screen. And I'm going to ask you to turn towards all these people out here. Yeah. And through with your hands, remember love and blessing comes through our hands, our words, our eyes, our presence. So you're going to bless all of them out there, and they're going to bless you right back, okay? We love, love you, you, we bless you, we appreciate you, we behold Christ in you, and we love you just the way you are. You guys are I'm sorry, I forgot to do a slide. We are starting a new book in our Wednesday book group, which is a fabulous group. So anybody who didn't want to come in the middle of the book, a week from Wednesday, we're starting a new one, I think. Okay, so the new book will be Daring Greatly by Brene Brown. Mm -hmm. And so that will be happening probably a couple of Wednesdays from now. Okay. All right, so let's take a deep breath. And once again, we are reading this morning out of How to Speak Unity. If you didn't know How to Speak Unity, you can buy a book of different terms about unity. And one of the words that this author, Temple Hayes, defines is the word being. And so this is what unity te teaches. Are we human beings or human doings? 
In our culture, we have created a belief that levels of busyness equal levels of importance. We need a 12-step group for that. <laughs> <laughs> to achieve this sense of importance, we often push ourselves past our natural limits. We were created as human beings rather than human doing. Let's all say that together. We were created as human beings rather than human doings. It is imperative that we remember to take time to simply be. Incorporating regular routines such as meditation or walks in nature rejuvenate our spirits and lower our stress. That's a good thing. What some of us were doing last Saturday at the Mayhair Spiritual Center. We were walking in nature. Nature is free to us and allows us to connect with our inner stillness. From the book of Psalms, we remember, be still and know, I am God. So part of what we try to do here at Jimmy, what we hope to do, is to create a space of stillness and peace even within the atmosphere of singing and teaching and listening and learning and encouraging one another. It's all about healing and we give thanks for that. Okay, now we're going to read our unity statement of purpose. Please, all of us together, I am the consciousness of Unity Christ Church, a unified board and congregation, nurturing spiritual growth, inspiring creativity, sharing time, talents, treasures, and expanding awareness of divine oneness. And Lily, we're going to invite you back up to do a song for us. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. So the song that I'm getting ready to sing to you was a dream. I was asleep and Beyonce was singing this song in my dream. Wow. <laughs> and I always have to give people space to laugh. <laughs> there was a man and he had moved, was very distraught. Apparently something tragic had happened in his life and he had moved into mental illness. And he began to walk around the middle of a water tower. And Beyonce lived on the second floor, and she could see the man in the water tower. And she looked out of her window and started singing this song to him. Then she invited the man into his house, to her house, and started stroking his hair and singing these words into his eyes. And I woke up, and I just kept singing the song. And so there will be a point in it at time while I'm singing that I will ask you to look into somebody's eyes and say these words.
God is my comfort and my refuge. Beautiful. And the daily word goes on to say this, life is full of joy and sorrow, but no condition is beyond the comfort of spirit. Whatever my experience, even before I voice my prayer, the comfort I seek is available to me. I have what I need for any situation. I ask and I receive. No request is too great or too small. Each one invites answers, abundance, and comfort to arise within me. All that I need is available for me to claim in this very moment. Spirit in me is my comforter, inspiration, and guidance to manifest what I need. Gratitude fills my heart as I know my needs are met. I am sheltered in the loving embrace of the divine presence. Peace fills me, heart and soul. God is my comfort and my refuge. And from the book of Hebrews, we who have taken refuge might be strongly encouraged to seize the hope set before us. And again, our affirmation, God is my comfort and my refuge. Okay. Now, for those of you, how many of you were here yesterday in the workshop? Look around the room. We had a lot of people here yesterday. Uh, I heard as people were coming in this morning saying this is one of the best workshops they've ever been to. Not just here, but any of their workshop journeys. So thank you, Chris. Dr. Chris Bache is uh, family. He's a part of the neighborhood, <laughs> partly because his mother-in-law is our own Anne Marie and our bookstore manager. And she first brought to us the word of Chris and his books. He comes to us after over 30 years of being a professor of religious studies, philosopher, teaching at Gunstown State. And he's former director of education with Institute of Noetic Sciences. Uh, two of his books are down in the bookstore, and he brings to us wonderful wisdom and insight. So he is our speaker this morning, and for those of us who want to stay after service, he's going to do a brief Q&A. So you can plan on uh, going to the bathroom real quick, getting some water, and coming back upstairs <laughs> after service. Okay, so uh, this is the title of his talk today. And we are going to go into a meditation <coughs> song, and then Chris is going to take over from there, okay? All right, so let's all stay seated, and let's, um, let's dim the light. Oh 
remember to hold this mic close up to my face. So if I drop off, you just shoot your hand up and remind me. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here with you today. It was uh, Labor Day, I think, Labor Day weekend when I was here last with you. It's nice to be back. So the topic today I'd like to talk with you about is no fear of death. And so uh, begin with meditation. Yes, okay, we are. That's good. Settle in. Feet on the ground, nice and solid. Feel a chair underneath you. Close your eyes. Settle into your breathing. <clears throat> And in your mind's eye, see all of us in the room in one large circle. This transposes into a circle. And take your left hand and put it on the shoulder, and in your mind's eye, put it on the shoulder of the person next to you. So that we're all together, touching each other, sharing touch sharing the energy of our lives. Feel that circle? <coughs> and now, bring to mind someone you love who's died. And see them standing behind you. Or more than one. And let them put their hand on your shoulder. Our hand. All while someone so now we have two circles. Second circle is probably larger than the inner circle. Now they have also known death, well, separation from someone they love. So imagine, bring to mind in your mind's eye, someone that the person you loved also lost, and let them stand behind them in a third circle, and put their hand touch the second circle. They were separated from someone in debt. So we're going to let this process repeat itself and repeat itself, adding, adding ring on ring, touching our shoulders, touching their shoulders, and touching each other until the ring goes back far at the time. out through history. Feel the enormity of the community of those who are united in death. And now in your mind's eye, Bring to mind the next generation, the children in front of you. And put your hand on their shoulder. And 
And then in your mind's eye, picture their children. And then their children. And again, put their hand on their shoulder, and then they put their hand on the next generation's shoulder, and on the next generation's shoulder. Those who have died, and those who will die. We feel the enormity of this community, and we just started out from the people in this room. And feel the naturalness of the coming and going of life. Just the natural simplicity of the cycle of birth and death. Sharing life experience and letting it go. Reaching back as far as we can imagine, reaching forward as far as we can see, as far as we can imagine. The community of life. And feel in your heart your oneness with this community. into the utter simplicity of this truth. Okay, wiggle your fingers and toes. Bring your awareness back into your body and back into the room. <laughs> so many things are changing in the world around us. There's so many exciting developments, so many powerful, transformative processes taking place in our life. And for me, as an academic, one of the great transformative uh, changes taking place in universities is around this topic of is there, uh, is around death and around the research which is changing our relationship to death. Because up until about 30 years ago, many people believed in life after death, and many people had faith in life after death, but not many people had knowledge, what they would consider you know, knowledge of that reality. And today, this is changing. Now we have so many areas of research which seem to be penetrating the veil of death. And so this pervasive terror which haunts the modern worldview. Ever since the rise of science in the 17th, 18th, 19th century, with this vision that the physical world is the only world that's real, and it all came about through chance, screened by necessity, and there's no meaning to life, and when we die, when our brain dies, you know, our consciousness just disappears. What a horrible philosophy, but that is the orthodoxy that's taught in the university where I teach and which is taught in universities around the world, and it is all outdated. Even though it's gospel, it's all passe. It's fading. So what I'd like to do is just give you uh, a, a, a sample of 12 books that I think give us interesting insights into this larger cycle of life. Because if you're afraid of dying, you really don't know what life is about. If you're afraid of dying, you've got it all backwards. When really, it's when you're born, that's when the hard work begins. But when you die, that's when recess comes. That's, that's where graduation takes place. So if you're afraid of graduation, then you don't know what you're doing. So let's get clear on what we're doing here. So today, I just wanted to talk about 12 books. And I've tried to identify 
the books which I've shared with my students through the years which have meant the most to them around the topic of death. In four areas. One, reincarnation research, the cycle of life. Second, near-death episode research, what it's like to die. Third, life between life therapy, which is the fastest growing area in hypnotherapy, a subdivision of past life therapy. And fourth, psychedelic research. Now, I know you may be surprised to hear that one mentioned here because we have a whole lot of negative conditioning about psychedelics. We all kind of went through the Reagan era and just say no, and we kind of forgot that for several thousands of years, human beings have been gathering in sacred circles using sacred memories, medicines to remember, help them remember who they are and recover their place in the universe. So that's the context for it. So I just want to give you three books. I'll pick three books in each of these here it is. So, oh, okay, keeping an eye on the clock. Here we go. Three books in reincarnation research, and I, I apologize for putting my own in the list, but <laughs> there you have it. <coughs> Other Lives, Other Cells by Roger Wolker, uh, who is a past lives therapist. He's now, uh, he just passed uh, about a year and a half ago, and uh, he's, so he's in the bleacher seats. Mm -hmm. If I am asked what's the best single <coughs> book by one author who is a past life therapist, the person I always say to is Roger Wolver. He's just a he's a wonderful writer. He's good. He's got a good solid grasp on the history of the tradition. Uh, he's a wonderful therapist. He takes you into the act of helping people recover their what I call their deep memory, helping people recover the deeper sense of who they are, helping them remember who they were before they were born, helping them trace down the knots that they find in their present life. Where did those knots come from? Some of them come from their childhood. Some of them come from a previous life or a life before their most recent previous life. He just untangles it beautifully. And then Carol Bowman, who's a nurse. I wasn't really interested in past lives therapy until her child started having night terrors. Her child started having fears come up in his dreams. And she got, like any good mother, she got involved in helping him untangle those dreams and helping him <coughs> uncover what was scaring him. And it turned out what was scaring him was the memory of a previous life that was beginning to bu bubble up inside his psyche. <coughs> and he helped her, he, she helped him accept that memory, live it, and then the dreams, the bad dreams stopped. And she got involved and she began to put something up on the web and hundreds and hundreds of people began to contact her and she started working with children and with parents of children who basically had these memories bubbling up. And so she became kind of a, a significant writer and player in the field. And this is a wonderful book. It's filled with lots and lots of case histories of children remembering their former lives, and she talks to parents and helps them understand that this is a totally natural, innocent thing, and how to help your child if your child starts to have these memories, which are not all negative, sometimes they're very positive, ecstatic memories, helping the children integrate those memories into the larger, because what we're doing is remembering our soul, because the soul is holding all of those lives. And Life Cycles was the first book I wrote, which, uh, as an academic, this was my response to Ian Stevenson's work, the study of small children from all over the world, who, when they begin to talk, they remember their previous lives, and he's been able to document this. I've been able, I think Stevenson is the Charles Darwin of reincarnation theory, and uh, this is my reflection on his research, bringing it forward, making it available, and then asking the question, so what? If reincarnation is a fact of life, what are the ramifications of living in a reincarnating universe? And I think they're, they're profound ramifications, because if you don't understand reincarnation, you don't understand what's happening. It's impossible to understand the logic of life, or the wisdom of life, or the intelligence of the Creator, if you think that we only live in life one time. 
That's like taking a, a Sherlock Holmes novel, pulling one chapter out of the middle of the novel, reading it, and trying to understand what's going on. You have to sort of think large. You have to learn to think in the perspective of God. If, if God would spend 13.7 billion years evolving a galaxy, why would God only invest 100 years in a soul? So, reincarnation, the cycle of life. But it, it, it dissolves the fear of dying when you understand that dying is followed by a rest and is followed by a return, which is followed by life, which is followed by death, which is followed by resting, and then is followed by a return. This wonderful cycle of life. What's it like to die? We know what it looks like on the outside. It's kind of unpleasant to look at from the outside, but what's it like to experience it on the inside? Well, let's ask people whose heart has stopped. Let's ask people whose brain waves went flat, and yet our medical technology pulled them back. Now we have millions and millions of people who have gone through this experience since the Korea War, where we began to develop trauma medicine. Here are my three favorite books in this area. The first two were written by Kenny Brink, who was a professor at the University of Connecticut all his professional life. He's one of the founders of the Near-Death Episode Movement, founder of the Journal of Thanatology. Uh, this isn't his first book. Heading Toward Omega is not his first book. It's his second book. His first book where he documented the phenomenon of near-death near -death episodes. The second book he's asking, what's the meaning of near-death episodes. What are we supposed to learn about life from studying near-death episodes? And he decided the best way to do this was to study people who had the deepest near-death experience. Because not all near-death episodes are the, as deep. Some of them are kind of superficial, some of them are medium, and some of them are very, very deep. Well, he said, let's focus on the ones who went really, really deep, who not only got out of their body, went through the tunnel, not only saw the light, but went into the light what he calls core in the ears. And he studies them in Heading Toward Omega. And they're wonderful, wonderful personal accounts. Because he has, he has collected from all over the world wonderful experiences. People share their stories with Ken. And he's a, he's a wonderful archivist of their stories. And chapter three of Heading Toward Omega contains 13 people's experiences of very, very deep, near-death experiences, and it just touches your heart, it touches your soul. These people have gone into God, and it's clear that they're touching something profound, and it changed their life. It changed their mind, it changed their emotions, it changed their values, it changed their religion, it changed their, their priorities, it even changed their physiology. Heading Lessons from the Light is Ken's last book on your death episode research, so it's kind of a, at the end of a long, distinguished career studying these things. This is his last volume on it, where he really pulls together the research. He studies near-death episodes of those who are blind from birth who have a near-death episode, and they can see, you know, even though they've been blind. He's, and there is a chapter, chapter 13 at the end, where it's called Returning to the Source where he has the deepest near-death episodes. And again, these are spiritual odysseys which are just profound. I mean, they're, they're just extraordinary. And their story is your story. Their story is your story. And you can feel this because when you read it, we've all died. We've been through this before, you know? And this is just remembering. It helps us remember our experience. It helps us connect with this larger landscape that life is part of. Now, what if this is just endorphin rush from the extinguishing? What if this is really just fantasy? What if this is just kind of a uh, wish-fulfilling kind of exercise? Well, here, let's take a look at uh, this last book uh, Pim, Pim Pam Womel, who's a Norwegian <coughs> psychiatrist. There have been many studies by scientists of the near-death episode experience. I think this is the best one. It's that if you really, if you have a really uh, skeptical spouse 
or you were a skeptical spouse and you really want to look at the, the near-death episode from a critical, scientific, philosophical perspective, read this book. Now, it, it, it's just really good, it's hardcore analysis, and his conclusion is, every attempt to explain away these experiences fails. They fail to do justice to the reality of the experience. When you get into the detail of the cases, these things withstand critical scrutiny just fine. Thank you very much. <laughs> this is the one I give my academic colleagues. When they want to go boo-boo this and boo-boo that, I said, okay, read this and then come back and talk to me. Now, just to throw a fourth one in, I couldn't help it. Proof of Heaven, you know, you, you know Eden, uh, Eden Alexander's work, we have this in the bookstore downstairs. Uh, wonderful, wonderful account. There are numerous accounts of one individual who has a profound near-death episode who had guts to write it down. It took guts for this guy to write it down because he's a neurosurgeon. Everybody knows. I mean, if the Hindus want to go to heaven when they die, that's fine. But Harvard neurosurgeons do not go to heaven when they die. <laughs> He's caught a lot of flack for this book, but I think it's a very brave and courageous book. One more area. All right, trying to stay on schedule here. Life between life therapy. What is that? Well, here are the three books here, and these are wonderful. We have two of them in the bookstore downstairs, the first two. Michael Newton's work. I like Michael Newton's work a lot. And if there were any one single book, in, I recommend to people who really want to address the nature of what happens when we die, I say start with Michael Newton. Because I know if they read Journey of the Soul, of souls, they're going to read Destiny of Souls, and the two of them really make up one volume of work. Michael Newton was a past life therapist. He was doing past life therapy, he was taking people into hypnotic regression, he was healing, helping people heal by uncovering the deeper sources of their issues in this life. And one day he gave a, a, an ambiguous instruction, and he found that his client not only <coughs> remembered their previous life, but remembered what happened to them after they died in their previous life. They were able to remember the time between death and birth. And he said, well, damn, that's amazing. And so he started taking people back into that life between life state. And when he had taken 600 people, right? how long does it take you to develop cases like that? 600 people into that life between life state he wrote this first book, Journey of Souls. And he just describes what his clients described happening to them. And then later, a few years later, he wrote Destiny of Souls. He kind of thickens the plot a little bit. And people were very interested. And they began to come to Michael and the therapists coming wanting to be trained. And eventually, he created an institute where professionals can come to be trained in doing life between life therapy. And that's what's happening in the third book, Memories of the Afterlife, where you have therapists who have all been trained by Michael, who basically, there's a short introduction explaining who they are and how they got in this work, and then there's a case history from their clients of someone who remembers the time between life. And this is the missing piece of life. The reason I call my book Life Cycles is because it, life is a cycle. And right now we're mostly paying attention to only one half of the cycle, from birth to death. But if you don't understand what's happening from death to birth, you can't understand the whole cycle. There, there is a logic to it. There is a progression. There is a debrief time when you die. There is the return to home, return to source time. and Michael emphasizes it's a social time. There is a community in heaven. And there are you are part of a, of a soul cluster, he says. Average number of souls he finds from his research is 15 souls in a cluster. And you tr it's like your class, your matriculation class. And no matter how many times you incarnate, no matter how many hundreds or thousands of times you incarnate, you always return to connect with these individuals. They're part of like your soul family. You go through life together. They don't always evolve at the same rate because some are slow learners and some are fast learners, but you evolve together. 
and their guides, and the guides have guides, and the guides' guides have guides. And he describes in great detail the texture of this community. And, the, and what I love about Michael's work is the detail, the detail of people who died, who had lived a life so mean, so vengeful, so hateful, they've done so much harm, they've hurt so many people. What happens to them when they die? And he says, there's no help. We all go home. But some people have been so mangled in life that it takes special, they take special care. Their energy has to be healed and, and realigned before they can return to the community of heaven. He goes in, and there are specialists who work with them, engage them, intercept them, hold them, heal them, and help them find their way back home. There's just layer upon layer. Michael fills in some of the missing pieces. And if you know the spiritual literature, if you know the mystical literature of the great saints and sages from Eastern and Western mystical traditions, everything Michael is showing us is coherent and congruent with what the mystics have been telling us. The difference is that now we have hundreds and thousands of people, just like you and me, who are going into this territory instead of being simply monks and nuns and, and isolated monastic retreats going into this territory. The secret knowledge of these things is becoming public. It's becoming part of our public record. And it's becoming part of your students' education in college. If faculty want to take them there. And it's, it changes lives. I've just seen so many students, it changes their lives. Because once you understand what's going on, not only do you lose your fear of death, but you, you grab a deeper meaning to life. You begin to understand what your life is about, the challenges that are embedded. And, by the way, Michael Newton describes the choices that we make in order to incarnate. What happens? And he shows how people know what they're getting into before they're born. They make conscious choices to enter the life they're, cho they're entering. Now, we might think, why would I choose a life like this? <laughs> Why choose pain and suffering? Why choose handicap? Why choose early death? Why, Why choose these things? But you have to look at life from the perspective of the soul, not from the perspective of the ego. You have to look at the purpose of life from the perspective of the deep soul's agenda. And the soul's agenda is much larger than our personal agenda. Life is not about being comfortable. Life is about becoming more, being more, challenge, and that happens through challenge. And lastly, psychedelic research, sacred medicine work. In the, in the indigenous traditions, they call these things not hallucinogens, because that implies that the visions which these trigger are false, but sacred medicines. And their tradition is that the gods knew when human beings incarnated, they would forget. They would forget who we are and what's going on. And these medicines help us remember. They help us remember who we are and what the game of life is. Now, I'm not talking about tripping, though tripping is interesting and fun. I'm talking about serious <coughs> psychotherapeutic work. And the, the man here, the foremost person is the man, the, so the founder, one of the co-founders of the transpersonal psychology movement, along with Abraham Maslow, is a man named Stanislav Grof. And he's written about 15, 16 books by now. And uh, this is the, him here, one of the great thinkers of the transpersonal psychology movement. And my favorite three books of his, particularly pertaining to the issue of death, what happens to us when we die, are these three books. Now, a little warning, this is not exactly easy reading. Uh, just because this first book, LSD Psychotherapy, this is a technical manual written for doctors and nurses and psychotherapists on the, how to manage psychedelic therapy, how to manage a therapeutic session. Low doses, high doses, counterindications, how to screen, managing the session, managing after the session. This is this is not Timothy Leary. This is a different, this is serious therapeutic work. This is uh, the, the modern recovery of an ancient tradition. 
after writing <coughs> LSD psychotherapy and writing several books on uh, the clinical implications for and the implications of psychedelic research for psychology and theories of consciousness and several intervening work and a book on their work in psychedelic therapy with the terminally ill, uh, helping them adjust to the reality of their impending death. He wrote this book, The Cosmic Game. The Cosmic Game is basically a discussion of the philosophical and theological ramifications of psychedelic research. So it's the cosmology book. It's the, it's the big picture. And Stan has a profound portrait of the big picture. And not surprisingly, once you understand, it's, it's nothing new. We've seen this before. We've seen it in the great mystical traditions of the world. We've seen it in the great meditation traditions of the world. Psychedelics is not the issue. Psychedelics is simply a method, one more method that humanity has used to tap into the very deep foundational core of our lives and the life of the universe. Meditation is a method. Trans dancing is a method. Fasting and isolation is a method. Silence is a method. The careful, conscientious use of sacred medicines is a method for entering into this reality. The third book, Ultimate Journey, is uh, specifically where Stan is addressing the issue of death. And he looks at death from a cross-cultural perspective, from an historical perspective. He's drawing upon South American traditions, Native American traditions, uh, Indian traditions, and psychedelic research traditions, bringing it all together. Uh, is there any mention of ayahuasca in any of those books? Uh, yes, there is. There is. Now, ayahuasca is basically another psychedelic uh, used. It's used in Brazil. It's legal in Brazil. The Brazilian government chose, investigated the communities that were using ayahuasca. They chose to keep ayahuasca legal. Uh, now, ayahuasca is legal in this country. There is a community in Ashland and in Texas and Houston that went, took the right to the Supreme Court and won the right to use sacred medicine ayahuasca in their church. Okay. So these are not renegades. These are not people who are pushing the outside. You know, it's on the outside of society. These are trying people who are trying to help society recover the powerful agents of self-transformation that have historically been the role of these sacred substances. Can they be abused? Yeah, they can. Were they? Yeah, they were. But if we have the wisdom to use them properly, they can be truly agents of deep sacred transformation. And I would just add the fourth book. My second book is in this lineage, set of Dark Night, Early Dawn. I'm writing as a philosopher of religion, and I believe psychedelics are very important to the psychology of consciousness and understanding the psychology, you know, the depth of the human psyche and this capacity to enter into the mind of the universe at large. Uh, so I'm kind of, I'm putting it out of the line. One of the things that happens in psychedelic therapy is, just like in all the other areas, you lose your fear of death. When you are able to tap into who you are underneath the body, who you are inside the very essence of the body and the wonderful universe that gave birth to you and brought you forward, well then you just stop being afraid of dying. Dying is your best friend. Dying is graduation. <laughs> dying is the culmination of your life. It's part of the cycle of life. If you read those 12 books, if you were afraid of dying before, I don't think you're going to be afraid of dying now. And even if you weren't afraid of dying, you're going to really understand the life process much more deeply if you read these books. Thanks very much. Thank you. So, what I hear you saying, don't worry me out. <laughs> I hear you saying that there's much more to our world and to our lives than simply getting more, living life, 
and leaning home. That there's an entire uh, spectrum of life experience in the body and out of the body. That we're surrounded by a community of uh, heaven. I love your term for that. The Bible said a great cloud of witnesses. And like you said, your friends in the bleacher seats. Uh, many of us here can feel the presence of our heavenly friends and loved ones. So I appreciate all the research, personal research and uh, learning, being mentored with some of these great thinkers. So thank you for bringing these ideas to us. You're always welcome. Thank you. opportunity to give prize and donations for the ongoing health and well-being and continuing of this wonderful community. How many of you know you're part of an incredible, beautiful, spiritual community here? And we have many communities, don't we? And some of our communities blend here. We have people who have their other spiritual paths, other communities, they come here to unity sometimes, all the time. So, for our ongoing blessing, we receive our tithes and donations. Uh, I have my tithe check here. It's my great privilege to be a tither and to tithe on my paycheck that I am getting today, right? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I can put my tithe in. <laughs> okay, so we have a blessing and a hand mudra that goes with it. Everybody, please. I am life flowing through me, blessing these gifts to radiate peace. And our band will bless us with music. Thank you. And away we go.
repaving of this road out here in front of the church. They did it incorrectly. Imagine. <laughs> it was just, so they're going to come and repave and restrike. So if there's a problem parking out here next week, you can park behind the church. Yes, ma'am. I'd like to make a comment. When I did park this morning, I was told that an individual down the road is attempting to tow. Okay, so anyway, so there may be some parking issues next week. You can carpool, you can park in the back of the church. A few folks parked at Old Time Pottery and walked over. It's not a long walk. Or tell us you need a ride from Old Time Pottery and we'll get some folks to do a, a little carpool. Is that okay? All right. Here we go. Let's all stand and make our circle.